Maki Lohiluoma. I'll be moderating the panel on behalf of Toivo Think Tank, which is the co-organizer of, of this specific panel. Uh, the Finnish member foundation also for the Martin Center. Uh, we work with the Martin Center a lot on, on youth-related issues, so, so the panel also is titled Youth and Economy. So to, to pick up on the work that we, we do throughout the year. So thanks for, for all of you for coming. I know we're still waiting for one, uh, one panelist to join us, along with a larger group of, of young people who are, who are joining us in approximately 10 minutes. So when, uh, when the group enters, don't be <laughs> alarmed. It's, uh, it's pre-planned. Pre so. uh, we'll, we'll begin with the uh, uh, short introductory uh, remarks from MEP uh, Mrs. Henna Virkkunen. A former education minister of Finland also, so Henna, uh, please uh, go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Should I speak from there or from here? Or it's up to you. Uh, maybe I can stand because people are sitting too much nowadays, so it's more healthy to stand up <laughs> sometimes. Yeah, good, good morning everybody. It's nice to see you all here and hopefully, hopefully we will have lively discussion about this important topic, about your youth and policies. Uh, at first, I have to mention that today it's a very important day for us uh, as a Finns because exactly 25 years ago, in this day, we had a referendum in Finland if we should join the European Union. And it was also the time when I entered into the politics because I was taking a part of this Yes for EU uh, movement. And luckily, uh, we, we were winning this referendum and Finland joined the European Union. So this is a very important day for for us. And the reason why I wanted to join this uh, movement, Yes for EU, the main reason for me was that I wanted that Finland should uh, join Western European uh, democratic countries. And I think it was very important and, of course, clever choice from Finland that we did it. And now when we look uh, the situation in Europe, of course, we can see that we are facing many, many challenges and what has happened in 25 years. I think the uh, no world has changed. But uh, the positive thing when we look about the younger generation is that now uh, in the last elections, European elections in May, they were taking part very actively to European elections. We could see that uh, the turnout in the European elections in May, it was... Uh, it was higher than ever. It was 50%, not very high, but if we think about European elections, in the last time, five years ago, it was only 42%, now 50%. And we know that the reason behind of this turnout, it was driven by young people. They were taking very actively part of these elections. And especially the young citizens who are under 25 years old, and also the next age group from 25 to uh, 39 years old, they turned out in a greater number than before. And I think it was very, very positive that they were interested in European politics and they wanted to take a part of these uh, elections. Uh, and what were the main reasons why they were voting in European elections in 16 countries, the main uh, 16 member states, the main reason for participation in the elections and why the people were voting was the economy and growth. They were interested in European economy, European growth. And the uh, next issue, most important in eight member states, was climate and environment. And I very much agree with these topics because I think they are clearly the most important European topics right now the economy and growth of Europe, and also the climate and environment. And I think that both these topics, they are very close to younger generations' hearts also, because these are very important for them. The young generation will face all the difficulties if we don't succeed with the uh, actions in the, in the uh, climate change sector. And also, of course, economy and growth, it's very important for younger generation and their future. And now we will also have our Finnish delegation arriving here. It's very nice to get more young people to this room, so we will have, I think, a very lively discussion. But then when we look at the statistics in the European elections, of course, I'm very worried about the Finnish young people, because we can see that in Finland the situation was not that, that the young people were very active in the elections. In fact, in Finland, the most active uh, age group was those who are more than 55 years old. 
So in Finland, the young people, they were quite passive in these European elections. Only 27% were voting. And if we are comparing it for our neighbor countries, uh, Sweden or Denmark, in Sweden, 85%. And in Finland, 27 Also in Denmark, 65 So I think it's very, very big difference. And I think it will be very interesting to hear also from our young guests who are just coming here into the room, that how they see that what is the reason behind of that, that why the young generation in Finland, they were not so actively taking a part to this European elections, even that we know that they have a lot of information about the European Union, they are very well educated. But is it like that, that nowadays, often the young generation is also taking too much things in granted? They think that, of course, we have security and we have peace and we have welfare state in the Nordic countries. And uh, they don't always uh, understand the connection between politics and their everyday life. But maybe these words from, like, uh, opening uh, words from my side, and then I'm very willing, of course, to hear all the thoughts and ideas and comments from the audience and, of course, from the other panelists also. Now we also have uh, have been joined by the last missing panelist, so I think it's uh, it's also perfect timing to start start the discussion. Uh, we have uh, great panel speakers today. Uh, on my right, uh, Mr. Dr. Oandrea uh, from the Martin Center, specialist in economic and, and social policy, uh, currently focusing, I believe, most on Ireland, UK, uh, EU relationship, but uh, but also, I believe, uh, an expert on on this matter as well. And then on my, on my left, uh, Mr. Juha-Pekka Nurvala, senior political advisor for the EPP, uh, also a, a predecessor of, of mine in, in a way. Of, uh, already in his teens, he, he led the, the international work of, of KNL, so the Finnish uh, youth uh, of, of Kokoomus party, who I, I know many members just joined from, from this organization, went on to serve uh, as the first vice, vice president of YEP as well. And then uh, on my right, Mr. Mikael Lehtonen, board member of the Finnish Youth Council and the coordinator for the National Coalition Party Youth as well. So welcome, thanks for, for all of you for, for joining the discussion. Uh, I believe we can pick up on some of the points that, that Hannah was discussing, uh, but first I would like to ask all of you uh, one thing. Uh, if you had to name just one, what would be the most pressing, most difficult issue currently facing the young generation in Europe? Uh, and along with that also comes the question of solutions to this. Uh, we can maybe go on the detail on those a little bit later, but first on the problems. What would be the number one uh, big problem uh, facing a uh, young generation in Europe right now? Hannah was picking up on the economic growth and, and environment. Uh, Juha Pekka, how, how would you describe the situation? Um, I'm quite close to this one. So when I was preparing for this one, I was just having a look of the numbers a bit like, okay, how did the last... 10, 20, 30 years, treat the young generation and, and people in the, in the Western world in general. And um, 2005, 2014 was an exceptionally horrible time for essentially the whole of Western world. Um, so 65 to 70% of all households saw their income either to stagnate or to go down. Among the youth, this was even worse. But that's not the, the key thing. The, the key for me, what I think policy makers should issue uh, should address as the first thing is the employment of low and medium skilled people and especially low and medium skilled youth uh, employees. Because these ones, so the thing is unemployment rate for high skilled is something like 80 to 90 percent, medium skilled 70 percent, low skilled 50 percent. And now they're in their 20s so they will be there for a long time, it will only go down as time will pass, they will have no chance of buying property, um, pensions will be very, very um, difficult. And for me, the, the two, so I would address the low and medium skilled and their employee uh, employment opportunities. And for this, I see two ways, either skills upgrade or a massive reform of our taxation system that actually is a lot, lot cheaper to employ uh, people. Thanks, Juha Pekka. Uh, I'll give the floor to Owen. Uh. Uh, first of all, thank you for the invitation. It's an uh, honour to be an honorary Finnish uh, person on, on this panel. Uh, I would say the Irish and Finns have 
quite a lot in common. A love of property, a love of alcohol, and uh, a love of a few other things. A banking crisis occasionally. Um, what I would say is, yeah, just to pick up on, on, on Yuha's point, um, I would describe it as the transition from education to work. I think something's been lost there. Um, and I would particularly focus on, you have mentioned the you know, low and medium skilled, and I would even focus on the university graduates. Uh, I think it is just not, um, it's not sustainable, the situation we have now where people uh, come out of very good universities with a very good education, and I, they're on what we describe in Brussels as the kind of the internship circuit for another four or five years, and basically they're hitting 30 before, um, before they can get a, you know, a, good, a, a good position. It's just not sustainable. It, it has all sorts of economic um, and social impacts. Often a lot of people feel a bit uncomfortable talking about this, but this is the, the reality. Um, a couple of years ago, the uh, German economist uh, Enderlein and the French economist Jean uh, Zani uh, Ferry, from, from the, known here for the Bruegel think tank, prepared a report for the uh, German and, and French governments, which was largely ignored. But there's some fr absolutely frightening uh, statistics in it that um, the average age that a German woman finishes education, uh, full-time education, is 28. And there's a, the traditional school of thought is that this is great, we're very highly skilled, there's great choice, it's affordable, it's not like the UK, to a lesser extent, Ireland or America, you know, people aren't coming out with these huge debts, but this is all sorts of economic and social consequences. And it's not... Uh, unrelated to issues like fertility rates, marriage rates, and stuff like this. Because if you're coming out of college at close to 30 years of age, before you can even think about the rest of these things, you need to get started on your career and your work. So it has all sorts of, of, of uh, uh, social impacts. Um, so that's the key issue. I don't want to talk for too long, but I'd be happy to talk more about it, okay. more about it later. We'll, we'll certainly pick up on, on that as well. Uh, Mikhail, the same question to you. Uh, one uh, key issue facing, uh, facing the younger gen generation in Europe. Well, uh, thanks for inviting me and sorry for being a bit late. We just arrived with, uh, with the group of our young uh, KNL youth um, party members here in Brussels. Um, if there's one thing that I would like to talk about, it's also the unemployment um, and the employment of, of the youth. Um, Nowadays, the um, role of the working li life has changed a bit. Um, for example, when my uh, father entered working life, um, he was pretty sure that he would be in the same company for, the f if he did his job well, he would stay in the same company for maybe until he'd retire and he's still working in the same company. Um, whereas for the generation that is right now entering working life, it's a bit different. There's a lot of projects, a lot of um, these fixed term uh, contracts and um, us young people, we are not really sure what to expect from the future. Um, so um, I think that that's one thing that um, EU decision makers and national decision makers as well should uh, should concentrate on and think about how to how to solve that problem. Mm. Of course, the um, main point of it all is to make sure that the economy is stable, but also also make sure that young people really have opportunities to work. And uh, also, I'm not saying it's entirely a bad thing to <laughs> work in different places and to see different thing, experience different different jobs. But um, if we can't be sure if we'll be uh, working in the next five years or not, we it's just not really working that well. From from what I gather, I, I believe all of these three are, are also interconnected. Uh, you talk about the low and medium skilled workers, the low uh, low employment rate, the fragmentation of working life, along with the the late stage of entering uh, what we would call normal uh, normal workplaces, normal uh, working conditions, normal terms. Uh, Hen, how does this uh, this uh, sound to you? 
You know, yes, I agree very much also if we are thinking that what is the biggest challenge or problem for young generation in Europe. I don't know what our audience think about it, but I think also that it's uh, maybe the unemployment if we look at the whole big picture. Of course, in the long term, anyway, I see that uh, climate change is it's a big challenge for younger generation because if we are not successful in the actions, then after 50 years, the situation might be very, very difficult in global scale. It's not only, of course, in, in Europe. But then uh, when we speak about unemployment, it's not, uh, it's not also a very easy task to solve in the European level, because I think in the member states, it's very, there's big differences between member states. And it's not only one group. Uh, you were very much uh, focusing to low and medium skilled uh, people, but it's true that also those uh, young people who has very good, uh, you know, who have had, who have been studied in the universities and who have had a very good education, it's also for them often difficult to find uh, jobs. But I think if we should um, have one solution in Europe, I think in all the member states, we should invest in more to education and the reform also to educational structures in different member states, because now the working life, it has changed so much that nearly all of the member states, they have to update also their own systems. And one big problem, of course, it is that when we are looking at the 15 years old, in, in European level, 20% of them have low skills in reading or maths, in, in the basic skills. And of course, it's very difficult if you, you're 15 years old and 20% of them can't read or they, are very, they have problems in math or science, then it's very difficult to continue to studies. And nowadays in Europe, it's also difficult to find the jobs if you don't have any education and if you have, don't have basic skills because of automatization and robotization, we have you know, automatized that kind of very easy jobs. And then often you need to have some kind of skills and, and uh, knowledge to get a job. I think Juha Pekka was uh, looking at me. No, no, okay, okay, okay. Maybe. Yeah, go ahead. Go. And one thing that's very important is also the fact that we need to bring working life and education closer to each other. Because, for example, where I come from, Finland, we don't, have I we don't really have any interaction between working life and education in, in upper secondary schools, in upper secondary, kind of like high schools. So um, we should make sure that you can do internships. It's maybe one day a year, even that helps. Um, in order to make make sure that young people really enter um, and also have um, realistic expectations of what working life life is like. You know, this is also something that has been on the on the frame in Finland, increasing these uh, these type of opportunities. Yeah. So so far we have investment in education, good basic skills, uh, and uh, uh, correspondence between working life and and, and education. What else do we need to do in, in order to make sure that we tackle these, uh, these issues perma uh, permittively? You, you talked about the tax system uh, in, in general. Uh, do you want to go in, in detail uh, with that? Yeah, a bit, a bit, I suppose, on the taxation in the sense that, like, okay, it's a radical I'm, I'm not really advocating with. Mm. Essentially, we should take away taxes for work that is carried out by, me by medium and low skilled people. Like, that's the biggest obstacle right now to hire people. It's just way too expensive. Because like one way or another, people will need to have the kind of income from work that you can live with it. If the income from work is not high enough to live with it, then it means that the society will need to subvent it one way or another. So whether you add some kind of a social security aspect on it, or you just really reduce taxes on labor, it doesn't necessarily make a difference, but it will be cheaper and less bureaucratic just to reduce the taxes on income. I'm not saying that we should reduce the income on all levels. I'm now particularly speaking about income on labor for those, for the kind of sectors where you have the, the low and medium skilled people. Because like if you cannot, if we cannot upgrade their skills in the sense that not everyone can go to university, like you said. If people at the age of 15 cannot necessarily read or do the kind of calculations that we will need in the future, even though STEM education will become more and more, uh, more, and more important in the future. One way or another, we need to make sure that these people can enter the labor market. And if the wage that they need to survive is higher than what the employees, employers can pay 
after with the, with the taxes and side costs, we have a conundrum which we need to solve. And here I think the policymakers, but you're absolutely right, European level, there's not much that can be done about it. This will have to be sorted at the, at the national level. So that's the, the taxation aspect. I think we, we really need to be radical on it, because what I was just uh, checking was that if we remain at this growth level as we are right now, for the next 10 years, 70 to 80 percent, we are talking about about 600 million people in the advanced economies, will see their income either stay the same or to go down. That's like 600 million households. It's a lot more people than that. We're now talking about households. If you say it's 1.5 person per household, we're talking about nearly a billion people that will see no advancement in their uh, disposable income. I personally, I struggle to see how we survive that politically without making changes to make sure that people actually get to go there. Second, in terms of if we go more towards the youth, I think housing. The, the thing is that we really need to start building housing a lot more. Young people cannot go there because the asset prices are going, uh, growing faster than inflation and, uh, and wages. So every year the house is actually going further away or you need to re you reduce your expenditure, which will have an impact on the GDP and increase your savings. Um, that's the big difference between me and my parents. Like when they bought their first house, inflation helped them tremendously. Asset prices were going up. Okay, interest rates were higher, but so was inflation. Right now, that's not something that we are looking for. Owen, do you want to, to pick up on the, uh, on the reduced taxes point? Uh? Yeah, I think it's, 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 <laughs> it's good that you have mentioned this, because sometimes when we're talking about young people and the challenges young people face, we often get stuck on two things, which is like, yeah, we're going to have the digital economy, we all need to be more flexible, blah, 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 which is fine, I agree with all that, right? But sometimes there's a gap between the political re rhetoric and what people face on the ground. Um, it's like electric cars. Listening to the media, you would assume everybody drives an electric car. But on, a, on an economic and just from a technical view, viewpoint, we're probably at least a decade away from, you know, from making that a, a, a reality. So it's not just about education. I would argue that we need a fundamental shift. I think you has right. I don't think we, could, we can survive another decade or another two decades of very low growth and all these young people. Uh, I, don't think the, I don't think the EPP or I don't think the socialists will survive it in, in, in their current form or possibly is a lot reduced. So as well as education and social security, I would argue that we really need to start, people talk about it, but they don't actually um, you know, really implement it. Uh, we need to talk about lifelong learning, and we need to make lifelong learning uh, a key element of every education department in every member state, whether it be tax reliefs or, you know, some central pot provided by the state or incentives for employers. Uh, there needs to be some sort of framework for career change, because as was noted, I certainly haven't stayed in the same job since I was since I, I, I left university, and I don't think any of my peers have first uh, either. Uh, we need to talk about work-life balance. We need to talk about supports for people. We need to talk about supports for people who have children, who are minding elderly parents, who want to go back to education, who want to go back to work. That's absolutely uh, uh, critical. And we also need to talk about, um, as you have said, housing, but we also need to change our mindset a bit. We need to get away Young people today need to get, including myself, we need to get away from chasing uh, the life that our parents had. And I actually think the problem here isn't young people. I think if you go to Italy and you go to Greece and you're talking to young people, they perfectly understand the economic situation that Greece is in because they're, or Italy because they're living it every day. It is the expectations of the older generations that the younger generations uh, will have exactly the same model. In some ways, the younger generations have it better than older generations. They travel more, they have more information, they're more mobile, probably job opportunities in general are better if, if you consider uh, the total context. But in other 
aspects. We're talking about the social security model, we're talking about taxation. We need to get away from this idea because those models are still based on you work for 40, 45 years and you draw a pension at the end and you pay your taxes every month. With freelancing, with the gig economy, with uh, you know working from home, with freelancing, that's all going to change. It's still kind of uh, changing at the edges at the moment, but I'm pretty sure if we were having this debate in 10 or 20 years' time, we're going to be talking about a pretty fundamentally different economy. So I would argue that, yes, uh, we, need, uh, we need change, but it can't just be about uh, education or tax reform. We need, to, we need to think bigger. And if you look back on history, you know, Ireland and Finland, one of the similarities is that uh, we achieved our independence uh, at the same time, roughly, and uh, we survived the two the two wars and prospered eventually <laughs> in Ireland's case. Mm -hmm. But I think what you will see is, if you consider a global context, but particularly a European context, you had a huge uh, shift in the economic model in 1918 <coughs> after the Great War. You had, you know, um, uh, votes for women a great kind of egalitarian movement away, f away from the elite, yet something similar after the Second World War uh, in, in the late 40s with the social market economy, which is you know, at the very heart of, of the EPP. And I think that a combination of technological change, it's been so, like I'm, I'm old enough to remember the pre-2007 university world, which was, you know, no iPhone, you know, no smartphones, limited, tech, limited uh, internet, you know, it was a different world, but technology has changed so great. And if you couple that with the financial crisis, which has been the biggest financial crisis since, since the Great Depression, I think you really need a fundamental shift. And I think the problem with parties like the EPP often is that they like to hold what they know dear and what they, which is fine, but it does have to be evolved for the 21st century. Otherwise, I, I definitely agree with you how we're going to use, we're already losing young people on climate, uh, and we're going, to use, we're going to lose young people on jobs, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Yeah. I, maybe I'd like to continue because I also very much agree that the reforms has to be taken in the taxation policy and in education in the different member states and also in public administration and in the labor market and a lot of reforms are needed but this is something what the member states they have to do and they are responsible for that. Uh, but then, of course, it also matters what we are doing in the European level, that what kind of opportunities the young generation will have. And I think it's very much depending uh, on uh, com uh, competitiveness of European Union, that how competitive we will be in the future. I think there is also many uh, mm, possibilities for young generation as we have... Uh, aging population in Europe, so it means that everybody is needed in the job market in the future because uh, millions of people are retiring in, in Europe in, in the next years. But of course, then it means that they have to have proper education and, and skills to get the, get the jobs. But also, now it depends very much that how competitive Europe is in the future, and especially you mentioned, and you mentioned also the digital economy, and we know that it's a big challenge for Europe because we are all the time lacking a little bit behind of USA and Asia in digital economy, and it has uh, changed very much the job market and the world economy also, how it works. And that is uh, certainly some uh, one area to where we have to focus also in the next years in Europe to be competitive in this area. Because I think, the, of course, the main achievement in Europe has been that we have the free movement of people and goods uh, in, in Europe, but then we know that when we speak about digital services, often we still have barriers between the member states, and we have been working a lot during the last years to create one digital single market uh, in Europe, because it's important for the companies and for them, for their growth and investments. So I think very much also depends on that, that how competitive Europe is in the future. Is Europe that kind of place that uh, companies would like to innovate and invest in Europe? Do they see that there is future in Europe? And I think it's very much depending that if the, uh, if the business life, if they see that there is, um, uh, there is future for them, then they will, of course, invest in Europe and they will hire people in Europe 
but there, there we are in the global competition now with Asia and USA, and there we have to have efforts in the European level to take care that we are competitive in the future, and I think digital economy is, is the biggest sector there. To pick up on the, on the notion by, by Juha Pekka that I, I believe you said that EPP won't survive another, another decade of, of, of slow growth or, or stagnation, uh, maybe to even increase the crisis awareness in, in that in the young, young, uh, young voter groups, we're actually right now even not, not surviving this generation, to be, to be very frank. Uh, I know for a fact in the case of Finland, Kokomus has been uh, one of the leading parties always with the young generation, the voice of the future in, in many ways. Uh, in the last parliamentary elections, we got 10% of the votes of the very youngest voters which is a ridiculous result for, 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 for our party. And I know this is the reality also with, with many, uh, many EPP parties around Europe that we rely heavily on, on, on uh, voters that are, are aging, that have already retired or are at the end of their working life. Uh, to pick up on all of these, uh, these tools that we've discussed, uh, the digital economy, uh, taxation, uh, investment in education, <coughs> while doing this, how can we redeem our credentials as the voice of the future in, in this respect. Uh, how can we win back uh, these young voters? We can perhaps, yeah. Well, in my opinion, it's very important to talk about economics, and that's one of the main main themes of uh, Kokomus and of EPP as well. But then again, um, it's not always very tangible for the young voters. Um, uh, for the young voters, they want to hear about how their life would be better, what would make um, their future more sure, more prosperous. And for that reason, I really think that EPP and Kokomus and other EPP parties around Europe should talk about, for example, the things that we've discussed here. And one of the big things is education, because that's a thing that every, um, every young person has, um, has an opinion on and, and has something to say and, and really understand what, what, is it about, what, it's, what it is about. And then again, well, education is not really, really a thing that is solved in, in the European level. It's a national thing, but when we talk about, for example, Erasmus uh, student exchange program, um, I would hope and I would uh, make sure that um, EPP really, um, really um, values the um, the Erasmus exchange program and make sure that the the funding will will be stable or even even grow. I'm not sure. Maybe some of you know better, but in the multiannual financial framework, the, um, the part of the uh, exchanges will, will increase or, yeah. So we have to make sure that that, that really happens. Yeah. If you can throw a few more uh, on, on that one to continue on it. I think particularly, so for, I'll have it like in two parts. For the, for the youth, and, and then, because we already talked about the, the, um, the economy, so I just want to throw two other things for the economy very quick before going on the youth, because they will be crucial for, for our youth as well. One, we need to get women to, uh, like, ha higher participation of women into the labor market. And this will, presumably, I suppose, will mean, again, investments into childcare. Of course, I know that taking care of children is not uh, responsibility for women, but that has, according to research, an impact on participation levels. The second thing is that we really need to massively invest also using public funds. Since 2008, every year we have lost 260 billion of investments. You can do the maths and as a cumulative effect how much that has an impact. And if you would increase women's participation globally, that would be something like 12 trillion more for economy, so that would solve most of our problems. Um, but with regards to the youth, I think there are particularly three uh, topics that we really need to tackle. First one is the housing part. It's unacceptable the high, you know, how high the, the rents are. Uh, most of good employment opportunities nowadays are in cities. So people are packing in cities and where we don't have enough housing stock. And then we have houses all around the countryside where you can live and work remotely if you have a very good internet connection, but in many countries in Europe, you still don't have that. So there's virtually nothing you can do. So like, and of course I understand that there are 
large interest groups who don't want more housing built in, in, uh, in cities because that will have an impact on the asset prices. But this just needs to be cracked. And that politically understand that's a big thing. Then is the whole employment thing, as we already discussed. And then, of course, naturally, the last one is, is climate, which is really interesting when you think about it, is that our youth, that they are not really doing economically that well. And the one thing that they're really, really concerned about is climate, which is not directly about their income. It's about the overall common good, which is like, which to me is it's super cool. Like, uh, to be fair, I'm, I'm really uh, impressed by how one could say like how, how much of a, like, a, this common good attitude our youth nowadays have, or at least the ones who are really concerned about this. And that's, that's amazing. But one thing that I think what we are missing is that we are missing the European kind of a moon landing project, like something that people could actually associate themselves with. And here I think the public investment, for example, is a big thing. So is the taxation reform. Move taxes from labor, move it to uh, emissions and consumption. Okay, we also need to make some adjustments to make sure that those who have low incomes will actually also be, uh, be subvented. Um, but where is our like, high-speed uh, high rail network to, to reduce flying? Uh, where are these like, massive investment programs that people could associate themselves with? For example, in the Finnish case, where is our <laughs> railway line from Helsinki to Tampere to Oulu or from Helsinki to Turku to build essentially a employment area or catchment area for, for Finland, which would cover Helsinki, Turku, and Tampere in the sense that you would have one hour max travel area. People are willing to travel one hour for work. If it's more than that, <coughs> it becomes iffy according to research. These are the kind of things that we need to do. And at the same time, of course, these will, uh, re they will create employment. They will create, in general, a positive mood for the society. And after all, it Economy is psychology. Like people don't invest if they don't think that the future is going to be good for them. Well, when you had a yeah. Yeah, I, I think it's a very interesting question because I think sometimes you hear in more traditional uh, political cir circles. Like I was at a debate this morning about uh, Brexit and, and the UK, and the debate is always that you know, if more young people had voted, we wouldn't have Brexit, right? But I think it's a fallacy that young people aren't interested in politics. I think the difference is that young people engage on issues that are really important to them. And I think it's diffused in a different way because of social media and um, all the technology. In my experience, young people aren't interested in watching two old white men in the parliament talk about you know, taxation priorities for the next year. I'm not particularly interested in that myself, I'll be honest. But what they are interested is in issues that uh, di <coughs> directly impact on their value systems. I will give the example of Ireland, uh, which the uh, referendum on gay marriage, the referendum to repeal the Eighth Amendment on abortion, was driven by young people. The power the enthusiasm, the energy from a lot of parties. These people, these young people didn't particularly identify by party. It was about the cause. And they, they actually drove the political parties to change their positions. It, it became that, that overwhelming. And I think uh, we're seeing the same kind of energy with climate. Uh, so for me, the two, the two issues are climate and jobs. Um, but I think actually uh, um, Belgium is a very good example of uh, the challenges, the really hard choices that national governments will have to make if they're serious about giving young people a proper chance. I work under a Belgian contract. As people know, the, the, the taxes on labour in Belgium are, I think, the highest in the EU, if not, if not in, the, in the OECD as well. So that makes it very, very difficult, uh, you know, for employers and for employees um, to create these entry-level positions, even for graduate, graduate entry, entry-level positions. But at the same time, uh, property is very lightly taxed, and pr the property is overwhelmingly owned by 
you know, very middle class people in their 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, whatever. So obviously, uh, you know, Belgians... The children of these people. The children of these people, exactly. Mm -hmm. But I've been at many forums and many meetings where people say, uh, you know, where people will agree, yes, 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 we have to do something to help the young people. It's vitally important. And then when I suggest, well, maybe would you pay slightly higher taxes to help that? And they go, well, no, we need to talk about this. That's not acceptable. So that's the challenge. It's ultimately, I think most people understand, most politicians understand what, what needs to be done. It's whether it can be done, whether the political will, because most of the people who, most of the politicians are actually these middle-aged or above people who have significant assets or whatever. They're not 24-year-old young people looking for a, a contract after two or three in, internships. So that's, that's the challenge. Do, do most politicians uh, understand uh, what need to, needs to be done? <laughs> yeah, I have understood that most of them understand, but they don't know how they would be elected in the next elections if they are doing that. It's said by Sean Claude Juncker about 15 years ago, and it's still, still true. But uh, I think if we think uh, how successful EPP has been in, in the last elections in, in different member states, I think there's a little bit different... Uh, uh, reasons if we have been losing in the elections. I think Ireland is a good example of that, how the party has been modernizing uh, some of the ideas, like, for example, this gay marriage or abortion. Uh, I think it's important that we have now more modern line and the party has been quite successful now in Ireland. But then, for example, in France or in Italy, where we have been losing a lot of, a lot of seats, I think our parties there, they haven't just done the reform that should be done in France or Italy, and we can see the consequences now. <coughs> and in Germany, and this is mainly, I think, in the economy and in the job markets, the reforms which are needed in those countries. And in Germany, for example, it, it's, I think, very much the environmental and climate, climate movement, where our party was not so active than it should have been, and we saw that the Greens were taking quite much uh, seats during the last elections. And in Finland, I think also the main reason has been the climate policy. We haven't been so active in our party because young generation is in Finland, they are very interested in the environment and climate policy. And there we should be more active in Finland and also in education policy because it, it's something what is very important for Kokomus voters in Finland, the education policy and our voters didn't like uh, the budget cuts we had to make during the last term and that we can see in the elections. So I think for us it's very important in Finland to take care about the environment and education. Uh, in Finland, uh, voters, they very much trust to our party that we are taking good care of economy. We can always see that they know that Kokomis is the party who knows about the economy and is taking good care of that. But we have to also think a little bit transit it more to the level of uh, citizens and people because we often speak in very you know general level about the state and big companies but then we should also think about the citizen a little bit more and you know see it from their perspective and that is i think a very nice idea that ursula von der Leyen is having in her program because she is having a special portfolio for one of the vice presidents which is called economy that works for people <laughs> and i think that is something we have to also so keep in mind more that we have to speak like that the people understand what, what does it mean for them, the policy, what we are trying to. To pick up on this, uh, personally, I, I believe this is more of a personal uh, opinion than anything else. I'm, I'm quite worried about the tendency that we have in many countries where a lot of voters are shifting either to the Greens or then to the nationalists and populists on the other side. So this is not, we, we all always talk about uh, the, the Green movement and, and how uh, they are engaging with young voters, and, and they are, and that's a fact uh, we, we should not deny. But at the same time, a lot of these, uh, maybe not the yet far-right parties, but some, some somewhere close to that, are receiving 20, 25, 30 percent of the youth vote in many countries. How do you explain this? How, how, where does this come from? And how do we, on the other hand, uh, how can we uh, win back young voters on, on the pressure, under the pressure of, of these two? Mm. Mm, about this um, uh, far right and anti EU parties, I think uh, it's very much connected to the uncertainty of the 
people's own life because I think it's very important that we are empowering the people and giving hope for them. And then I think it's very important that we, we can take care of the basic needs that everybody can trust that, that they, can, they have f future also. And that's why I think it's so important to uh, invest in very basic skills and education and give their you know, give this em empowerment for people that they can trust to their own future. Because I think it's very easy for them to turn to these uh, far-right and anti-EU parties who are all often giving, you know, like uh, easy solutions for, for very complicated uh, questions and difficulties we are facing. And we can see it now in the last European Union elections that um, uh, in the results it was said that uh, those... Uh, who were voting anti-EU EU parties or far-right parties, they were very certain about the party, what they are going to vote. So there is not much competition in this field. But the voters of Green parties, they were very unsure. So they were that kind of people who were thinking about several different options, but then they were voting Greens. But uh, there is this difference between those groups who are voting Greens or then far-right parties. Also one explanation could be the fact that these far-right parties usually have a quite clear message. Um, it's simplified and it's not, like you said, it's they, they usually propose easy solutions, but they are also, their message can be very easy to understand for young people. For example, we don't want any immigrants, okay, we understand what that means, although even though it doesn't, you can't just say that. Um, and also, the um, I think the the fact why why it's also why the green parties are also very appealing to the youth is that they really have uh, um, managed to um, uh, managed to bring hope to young people, and that's something that we should also think about in EPP. And also, what is our what is our our clear message? Because we usually talk about very many different things, and we talk about the economics, but what is the what is the um, the thing behind it all? What is the key? What is the thing that we we want to achieve? And I think that's one thing that we should really um, we should really um, communicate to the youth so that they would be more interested in our party. Because if you if you if you have a clear message, then it always sticks. I just saw that there was a huge correlation between the feeling of economic stagnation. So if I feel that my income has not moved the last 10 years. Twice as many said that they also had trouble with uh, immigrants, with immigration, with trade, and that they felt that their culture was under threat. Twice as many. Um, and it also starts to feel to me that in, in many countries, but there are, there are huge differences here, is that voters, generally speaking, they have essentially three options. They pool the center right and center left now together, especially those voters who have not seen any kind of a change in their income levels. Because for them, that represents the same, nothing has happened, I'm actually either the same or worse off. Then the other option are the Greens, who are especially addressing the people who are maybe advancing or they are staying the same, but they are still hopeful about the future. And then many of those people are concerned about the environment. And for them, again, they think that the centrist parties, that the last 10 years we haven't seen much changes with regard to environment, climate change policies, hence why would I vote for them? The real alternative to me are the Greens. So they are between the centrist parties that they pull together, Socialist DPP and the Greens. And then on the other side, you have the people who feel that their incomes have been stagnating. They are very suspicious of foreign cultures and immigration. Again, they feel that the centrist parties have not done anything the last 10 years, because this is what my situation looks like. And the only real alternative to me are the populists. And this is a very difficult uh, situation for us. And I think what you were just pointing out is that like, the key for us in, in general is to like, get the economy rolling again. Otherwise, it's very hard to break out of this, this position in which we are currently where there is not much difference between us and the socialists. And like, let's also, like, you know, maybe we have to give credit for the socialist party in the sense that they have adopted many of the center-right policies in terms of economy. So you don't have the same kind of uh, juxtapositioning between like, you know, communism and the free world. That doesn't exist anymore. It's, uh, it's a lot more subtle now, especially between us and, and the center-left. 
whereas now that sort of border is breaking on the green side and on the populist side. And I think all these things that what we have discussed previously about the solutions and all these things, these are the keys to, um, to solve this one. But it also partially feels that as if we are like, we are the, uh, the frogs in the, in the boiling water, but we, don't, we haven't yet quite understood how warm the water is. That like there is missing this like sense of urgency. That like we had this sense of urgency right after the crisis, but the, the main effort was to make sure that the financial mark, the financial, the whole system doesn't collapse. We managed to do that, but thereafter we have <coughs> not invested enough into these social things. Yeah, just just a quick comment. Um, yeah, I think with the far right, I can only speak from my observations because in Ireland we don't really have a either a far right or a far left. But um, I think from my work in the middle classes around Europe, um, it's born of frustration. People, like, people need to feel like they have a chance to get better, so social mobility. And I think what we're seeing now is that people are begin younger people are beginning to understand that forget about social mobility, I will probably not even make it to the standard of my parents. Let alone, uh, let alone go further than that. And I think what you get then as that kind of morphs into pe working people in their 20s and 30s is that people feel like they're running, 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 but they're just standing still. Their income isn't really improving, their outgoings are continuing, taxation is increasing, etc. So I think it's that palpable, palpable kind of uh, level of frustration. And often that's associated with you know, the taxation stays the same, but there's the feeling that public services are declining. If you have kids, what's that? It's education and, uh, you know, recreational facilities, you know, like local facilities in areas like swimming pools, etc. So I think that's a, that's, a, that's, a, uh, that's a key issue, and I think you as right. I think probably we don't, we haven't yet realised uh, the urgency of the situation. Because if I was... 26 years of age, and I had done, you know, what everybody told me to do was the right thing, work hard, go to a good university, do all these internships, and if I came to the end of that process and still couldn't get a decent job, you know, I'm not sure if I would be so attached to the, to the centre ground of politics either. And it's very easy when you have these parties telling you that it's the EU's fault or the migrants' fault or America's fault or who knows what's fault. I think, I think that's very interesting. And I think history is important too and we shouldn't forget. Because if we were having this debate 100 years ago in Brussels, we would be sitting in the wealthiest industrial region in Europe, uh, South Belgium, Northern France. And you can see now how, how the politics of that region, Front National dominating in Northern France, and I think it's the left-wing Communist Party dominating in, 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 in Wallonia. So this has real, real um, impacts. With the Greens, I'll just give an example of the, of, of the Irish case. Uh, the Greens gained more votes from the centre-right EPP, Fine Gael Party, than from any other party, because they felt that for all the political rhetoric about how important the economy or the climate is, that the government was not serious about it and was not delivering. And when you're, you know, got a couple of kids and you're sitting for two hours in a terrible public transport system, you know, do you know what? I don't really care what the Greens are saying about the economy, but if they can solve public transport and take the cli climate more seriously, I'll vote for the Greens. Thank you. I think we're Coming to the last bit of, uh, of our time together, uh, at this point I could uh, open the floor uh, to questions. I think we have a microphone uh, maybe at least somewhere yeah, over there. We have time for, uh, for a few, few questions and, and some discussion maybe can also follow those questions, so not just uh, just the Q&A. Um, yeah. My name is Thomas Brandt and I work for the General Secretariat of the Council of the EU. And I'm a lifelong Christian Democrat from Austria. Uh, just a few practical questions slash remarks. Um, jobs for low and medium skilled young people. 
Have you considered in Finland a solution like the dual education system, apprenticeships that we have in uh, Germany and in Austria? Because our experience is it works quite well for this target group. Yes. Uh, second, on the, on the European level, we, we know from our statistics that we have a very strange coexistence of youth unemployment, also of highly skilled people, and a crying shortage for qualified workforce in many sectors of the economy. And there is a clear lack of human resources management already on the national, but certainly on the European level. Perhaps we could build on this highly successful Erasmus program and move, move people around, uh, help people to find the jobs they can do <laughs> in another member state of the European Union where there is a need for them. And third question slash remark, to say finally one good thing about Belgium, <laughs> they have developed these service checks in order to move uh, household helpers out of the black economy. Might that perhaps also be a model for other people in this freelance or gig economy to provide them with, them with a social security <laughs> network because through that service checks they get access to healthcare and to pension rights. Thank you very much. Would like to pick up on that. Yeah, yeah, yeah maybe I can start. We are in Finland, we have been many years, we have been looking your Austrian, also German model, uh, how you are educating young people that they can learn by doing. But it has been very challenging in Finland to, to promote this model because in Finland, the employers, they are used to that, that uh, you know, the municipalities and government, they are educating the people. And they also feel that it's, there's quite much work when you are getting maybe 16 years old to your workplace and you should teach. We are having some funding for that, but it's maybe it's not enough for covering all the, of course, energy <laughs> and time what you need to, to educate uh, the young people. We have this possibility also, but it's not very popular. It's clearly that uh, employers are using it more for the older people who have already some kind of education maybe and they want to update their skills and then they are coming and learning in, in the work life. But I think it's very good model you have, and we can see that the young generation, their unemployment rate is very low in those countries where you have this, this system. And one challenge in Finland is also that we have that kind of vocational education uh, that takes three years nowadays, and there is quite much theory also, because we don't want to have the system where it's dead ends. So it's uh, always the possibility that if you are uh, studying in the uh, uh, upper secondary school or then in vocational training, you can always continue to university. So it means that also if you are in vocational training, after that you can uh, continue in the universities and it means that uh, the education it's quite you know demanding because it's three years and there's quite much theory and it's quite heavy for those young people who are more work oriented and who don't want to sit in the classroom but we are trying to work with that that system in Finland but it's very good good point what you mentioned about it and then about the Erasmus it has been very important for us in the European Parliament that we would like to increase the funding for Erasmus because we would like to offer this possibility for more and more young people now it's mostly the students in the universities or in the uh, in the polytechnics who are going to Erasmus but now we would like to see more and more uh, young people from vocational training or from upper secondary schools to taking a part and also programs for teachers because we think that it's very important for teachers that they have also possibilities to that kind of exchange because then they can help their own pupils after that and then the students also to take part to Erasmus and um, in the parliament we have the target that we would like to uh, triple the uh, budget for Erasmus, but it's not decided yet, but Commission is also supporting that goal, that we should triple the funding, and now the Council is supposed to uh, decide something on the general level in the next days also about it. But I think it's very important that, because if you can, if you have the possibility to study abroad or work abroad, then it's, you will have much more chances, of course, in, the, in your working life, when you know a little bit better the other member states, languages, cultures, and so on. 
Yeah, and and that's also a good way to see what or what's all the good that the European Union has done. And about the apprenticeships in Finland, if I'm not incorrect, we have this system at least in some places where you uh, have like um, normal school for two years, and then the third year is kind of like um, training in the uh, in the in the. Um, uh, at the workplace, so I think that's also a kind of like a good combination between the two, between the two, because there are the problems that we, we can't just have uh, three years of only apprenticeships, because then you have to have the possibility to continue to university or to university of applied sciences. So just to say, I think the gentleman is absolutely right. Both of the suggestions are exactly the kind of measures we need to take. Like Sodexo, whether it's a Sodexo type, so I don't know if, if you know, essentially you can buy these like vouchers, you give it to the cleaning lady and you will get actually part of the, it's like 10 euros an hour that you pay, for example, for a cleaning lady, household, whatever, and then you get, I think, three euros back in taxation. Whether it's this kind of a model or something else that has the same impact, exactly the kind of stuff what we need. With regards to mobility, um, this one I'd just like to take one step further. Uh, we are now telling people, um, Italy, Spain, Portugal, wherever, especially the youth, like, okay, go and migrate, there will be jobs in, in Austria, in, in Germany, in France. France is doing uh, by far the best out of the big economies right now. Um, but it, it's not quite enough. Like, then thereafter, you do this. We haven't yet solved the issue of portability of pensions, healthcare systems, the different systems for labor uh, markets, rules, contracts, all the rest of it. And how about the cost of moving? So like, these are the things that are like, say, if I was now a politician, say, in a country which is in a dire need of more employees, I would certainly make a provision for companies to deduct at 100% the cost of getting someone to fly from and move from Italy to whatever country that would happen to be, to make sure that, like, one, it's easy for that person to move. Like, if you're now an Italian young person, you're maybe getting three, four hundred thousand, three, four hundred euros a month in social security, and then someone's like, I have a great job for you in, in, uh, in Germany. Okay, but then, you know, you will looking five to ten, five to ten K in terms of the first payment for your apartment, moving there and getting all the basic amenities fixed. So these kind of things, but again, like I don't know if Europe can do so much on this one. I think it's more at the national level, but with the pensions and portability that people in general can move, this is definitely something we need to sort out. Like these changes in economy are not going to be solved in the, couple of, in the next couple of years. These uh, changes will continue for, I think, for our generation, maybe even for the next one. Okay, Tommy had a question, then we had uh, one over there. Hello, Tommy Huhtanen, Executive Director of Martin Center. Um, me, uh, many of the challenges which were mentioned, especially ones of the UHAPEC, or, uh, for example, the real income stagnation and all of that, I think it relates to this whole debate on, on, the, on the which uh, state, uh, in which shape the global capitalism is, the state of free markets. And my question to panel is that for the center-right perspective, because this discussion is not new, no? it has been going on for several years, but there's a new uh, uh, pike uh, or hype in the uh, discussion, which is, uh, well, well, let's say, for example, a couple of weeks ago, Financial Times uh, had a big article where they kind of stated the challenge that there's, there's something in a, in a capitalist system or free market system which needs to be fixed, and followed by article. Also, the corporate America, uh, the big companies have made similar kind of statements. So, the issue from the center-right perspective isn't the risk, or if you look at the debate, is that, that when you speak about solutions from the, from the free market tiers, if you look the last couple of years, there's no real new ideas, if you are, in my view. Uh, but if you look the left side, there is there are uh, proposals, not new ideas, but for example, very high taxation after certain income, very radical re reforms, which are now entering, uh, entering the public debate in a European level, but also in a national level. Finland is a good example. If you look the last couple of months, there are very leftist proposals being made. So isn't the risk then for centre-right that, that if that's the that's the state, then the, uh, the, the only way real 
consequence is that, that this will mean more regulation, more state intervention, more taxation, uh, and less free market. In fact, today, you know, for example, to be uh, for free market, it has been classic uh, concept for the center right. But today, I think it would be very difficult to be free market optimist. You know, for example, it doesn't play really if you look at the public debate. So, so that's my question. Okay. Take another one at the at the same time and then answer uh, both of them uh, simultaneously. So hello, Augusto Leino, doing traineeship in the EP, uh, EPP group at the moment. And uh, my question is about uh, university education. And you kind of touched on this topic already. But uh, I would like to know about the panel. What is the consensus in uh, Parliament and in maybe EPP about the integration of university education in, Euro in Europe? Because, uh, yeah, EPP is for... Uh, expanding the Erasmus program, and I think it's all fun and games, but I do think it is more of a cultural exchange rather than educational exchange, what is happening through Erasmus, and that is not really integrating the university education in Europe. For example, a person who graduates from high school in Finland, if they want to apply to French universities, are already in a bad situation because our high schools are not integrated. There are some guidelines that try to uh, say like which kind of education resembles what in these countries, but in in real world, if you want to apply in with a Finnish university degree to France, they will not think you are the first candidate or they don't think you are equal because the systems are not the same. But I would like to hear your uh, thoughts on this, and this panel should be much longer. I really enjoyed. Thanks. Thanks. <laughs> okay, who wants to wants to go first? Do you have any economical <laughs> system for the world? Yeah, about global capitalism. Um, I think the big problem is that there is like missing notion of fairness. That uh, now, when people are thinking about capitalism, what they think about are big companies and that they think that big companies are not paying their fair share or that rich people are hiding their money in Switzerland, um, that not everyone is, is pulling their, their weight. This, to me, seems to be the, the one big issue that, that people are having with global capitalism right now. And also, to be fair, this criticism of where the growth is coming is coming to this kind of like rentier capitalism in which you have like, you know, Okay, no offense if anyone is a real estate agent, but like real estate agent is a, is a very practical and a traditional example of kind of a profession that does not growth any kind of growth, uh, that does not create any kind of growth, but just like takes uh, a price of the wealth without any like real uh, increase in the economy. And when you think about like you know, companies that have been like, you know, uh, booming in the last couple of years, you have many of these kind of companies, so there is a valid criticism there. Uh, with Tommy, I think this kind of a discussion would warrant a couple of good bottles of red wine and a, and a longer evening to come up with any kind of a proper con, uh, conclusions. Do you want to touch up on the Rasmus question? Yeah, um, just I'll, I'll comment um, on the, the free markets. Yeah, there are no um, new arguments from the free markets because the free, argu uh, the free market did fail. And the only reason it wasn't a global economic collapse was because of the actions of the Fed coordinated by the Federal Reserve eventually with some nonchalant, quite nonchalant Europeans in tow. We shouldn't forget that the, the crash wasn't, although sometimes it's perceived in Brussels as the big bad Americans and British Anglo-Saxons capitalists, I'm afraid the behaviour in Europe was just as bad as we saw with exposure to countries like uh, Greece and Spain, etc. So. F and I think that's what's behind uh, the, the, the reboot of the Financial Times. Because what people aren't, what the Financial Times isn't talking about now is unfettered free markets. It's not in line with the, uh, with the political feeling and it's not in line with public feeling. I think what they're talking about is free but fair markets. That's what people want to see. So the free markets will still be the core of capitalism, the core generator of wealth. But I think we have to respond just as was, was responded to after the Great Depression. In the short term, an increase in regulation, like in Banking Union, the Dodd-Frank Act in, in the US, in the short term. You know, that regulation is there because 
uh, the banks need that regulation. You know, speaking for a country from where the banks bankrupted the country because we had a very light touch regulatory, regulatory regime. But I think if done correctly, as was done correctly after the Great Depression, that model actually lasted from the 1930s to the early, to the early parts of this year. So it lasted for 70 or 80 years. And I think that's what, that's what, what, what needs to, ha to happen. I think the unfortunate position in Europe is that uh, there's been so much political f friction, the Eurozone crisis was so messy that all political will, all the political capital has been used up and now it's very hard to generate any political will to make any of these hard decisions. Even, even as economists would say, a relatively easy decision like finishing banking union is still difficult. Like yeah. It also feels to me as if like we are blaming the wrong people for the last crisis and that is part of the reason why we are not willing to take the next steps. Like, it wasn't the fault of the Greeks or the Italians, the Spanish or the Portuguese or the Irish that their economies collapsed. Like, we shouldn't be blaming them for it and we shouldn't now feel like looking down on people and like not be willing to take the next step to make, to fix our common house. This is also like part of what I, but you put it very eloquently with free and fair Yeah, markets. but And just on education, I think um, education is interesting. I think France is a very bad example. I think they'll be the last country to open, to open, open up to anything. But there are very interesting examples. I think the Dutch system is a very interesting example where they've become a real magnet in a kind of post-Brexit world for students from around the European Union. And they've done that because they have a, a certain sense of Dutch pragmatism. And they said, OK, if we uh, develop and deliver a high quality English language uh, postgraduate education system, we can become world leaders. And that's what they're in the process of doing. They've certainly stolen a march on Ireland. Um, and we have to see what's going to happen with, 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 uh, with Brexit. But I think, I think issues like this and issues like uh, if we want to increase mobility, of course, everybody agrees with all this in, 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 you know, at, at a general level. But the issue is that has a lot of very practical consequences. It has consequences about language. If you're going to increase mobility in a, an EU of you know, 27 different languages, it's not going to happen. There's going to have to be a couple of primary languages, uh, probably English, German, French, Spanish, maybe. You know, it's going to have to be. And this raises all the questions about identity and the role of identity in national education systems. Because to my knowledge, education is still very much a national, national competence. Um, so that's it. Uh, about the um, free market economy, I think uh, the model we should have, of course, and for what we have to work, it's that we should have um, fair competition and level playing field. So I don't think that free market economy in the way it's, it's dead, but of course this uh, digital age makes it very challenging because the digital economy is working like that. Uh, winner takes it all, and uh, it has been very challenging for, for Europe also in these circumstances. But I think uh, in the regulation we are trying to make sure that we should have a level playing field and fair competition, and that's for what we are working every day. And uh, about the education, it's... Um, it's competence in the member states, of course, as we know, but we are speaking more and more about the European educational area, and I think we were taking first uh, steps towards that um, around a little more than 10 years ago when I was Minister of Education in Finland. During that, say, the universities, they were deciding about this Bologna process, and it means that, but it was universities, it wasn't European Union. Universities did it themselves because, of course, they have a lot of autonomy, and they decide that they would like to have that kind of system where the degrees can be compared easier. And of course, it's very important for European Union as a whole also because uh, we want to have one single market and we want to have free movement of people. And of course, it means that then we have to have opportunities to to get jobs from the different member states. And there, it's very important that you can also compare the education, what kind of, what level of education the people are having. And I think ne during the next years, we will take more steps also forward in this European educational area. Now it's more like networking and best practices, uh, 
from different member states, but also Ursula von der Leyen was writing in her mission letter to educational uh, education commissioner that she has to work with this European educational area and make sure that we are completing it in, in the next year. So I think we will take new steps also in this field, but in the same time we have to rem remember that anyway it's competence of the member states, so it's very much up to them also how much they are willing to go forward. Quickly, it's also up to the universities how they encourage their students to to go abroad and to study abroad. But one thing that could be interesting in the future would be that everyone in every university, every university student in fin uh, in, in in Europe should should have to um, go abroad for at least maybe a month, maybe two months, because that would be a great great thing. And but also what you mentioned about the um, Erasmus exchange that. We should think about how to make sure that it's not only a cultural exchange, which is very important, but also a, a an academic exchange, and that you can l really learn things from an academic point of view as well. At this point, I have the unfortunate task of, of closing this discussion to make sure the the whole event also stays in within the parameters that that were given. Uh, thank you to all of our panelists. Uh, I think we had a great discussion. Hopefully the audience also enjoyed it. Thanks for all of you for, for coming on behalf of, of Toivo and, and Martin Center. Thank you.